Bonjour. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you today. Um, if during the session you have a burning question, I like that. I like to uh, interact with the audience. So don't hesitate. Um, so this is about the future of virtual personal assistants. And what we mean by that is not just an avatar. What we mean is a system that augments human capability and has some understanding uh, and adds intelligence to an interaction. So that is the, uh, the approach that, that we took when we created Siri. I also want to give you a little bit of the background because this is not just about Siri, this is about Siri and beyond. Um, my own role was a founder and a, a board member of Siri when it was a company. So SRI creates companies, and that was one of the companies that we created, and then that was bought by Apple. Once Apple bought this company, I know nothing. <laughs> it's a uniquely uh, secretive company, Apple. But I can tell you, and today I will tell you, some of the things that we did as the company. The company was formed in 2008, and it was sold uh, to Apple in 2010. And the chief negotiator for Apple at the time um, was uh, Steve Jobs. So um, let's talk a little bit about the venture, but first where it came from. Uh, for, any, for those of you that don't know, I'll quickly go through this. SRI is in Silicon Valley, the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, we were founded by Stanford University in 1946. We have been founded not as an educational institute, but an innovation institute. Our job was to deliver value into the marketplace. So Stanford University started us not to do research, to teach students, not to educate, but to deliver value into the marketplace. And it was actually to help create a... Um, uh, a commercial base in the Silicon Valley Bay Area in 1946. Okay, so um, there are about 2,400 people at SRI. We're in all the uh, technologies you can imagine, not just IT, but also medical and bio biotech, also physical sciences, robotics, uh, all of these different areas. So feel free to ask questions later about um, SRI. So, this is, um, for those of you that don't know, some of this was mentioned in the talks already about the history of SRI. I'm not going to dwell on this, but we were the first to receive bits on the Internet and help invent the Internet. And, uh, you know, those numbers on the checks that you see, that was a project of SRIs. The mouse was invented at SRI. Um, and, in fact, Siri is a major part of SRI. This is an important point. Um, part of the future of virtual personal assistants has been what's next. What's next now and what's next in the next two to five years. What you see here is, first of all, that SRI has been creating ventures in uh, this space for probably now since Nuance, when we launched Nuance, that was around 1990 that we created it, launched it in 95. Um, that's the speech recognition company. These other ventures that you see, Siri was one of the next, but beyond that, there's four more that we've actually started. They're private right now, uh, but I'll give you a little insight into that and then insight into the future beyond that. But the, the major point here is that virtual personal assistants are only just beginning. There's probably, um, we'll see in the next 50 years, major innovations across all areas of the virtual personal assistants. So, first of all, I just want to say, many of us know Siri. First of all, there was a hype about Siri when, it, when Apple bought it and it, it, it was delivered uh, to the marketplace on the iPhone 4S. Siri was in movies, on TV. It was uh, the... Uh, in, um, uh, it was spoken about and advertising all the time. People could ask it questions. This was beyond, actually, what was uh, built for Siri in the company. 
So what was built for Siri is what we're going to be talking about. But I'll have, I have to explain some of the core technology. Some people think Siri is only about speech. Um, actually, speech recognition is fairly robust and was done well already by Nuance, the speech recognition company, word-by-word -word recognition. Siri was the first major innovation that was to understand the intent of a request, a sentence, what we mean, the goal-based request. And it was, you know, what can I do for you today? Find a good Thai restaurant is the request near my office and give you an answer. Siri, was, this kind of understanding of the intent of a sentence is called natural language understanding. It's not word by word. It's what does that sentence mean? The sentence here says, find me some good tie near my office. That's the meaning of the word. Much more difficult at, at the time, anyhow, much more difficult than word by word recognition. That was the innovation. But beyond that, it was giving you an answer. So it had to reason about the question and give you an answer. Okay, so that was uh, the basis of that. Let me give you um, some examples of this. You know, these, these are meant to be examples of Siri and its limitations. Siri was a question-answer format. Get me something, do something for me, give me a response. It was designed when mobile phones actually, it was initially designed when mobile phones in 2007, smartphones, were, the iPhone in particular smartphone, was coming out. And with that kind of design, it was do something for me. The real reason we started this company, and many people ask how we start companies today, the real reason we started this company had nothing to do with trying to deliver natural language understanding to the world. The reason we started this company was when you had a mobile phone, a smartphone, and you wanted to ask for a service, you had to put your hand out and start clicking on the, your request. That kind of clicking, we estimated we were losing 20% of the audience for every click. So, when we invented Siri, we were looking for a core market problem. And the market problem was, find me a way to ask for something and do something without clicking. Find me a zero-click solution. It turns out that natural language is the most obvious way to do zero-click. And so, SRI then found some, and used some of its disruptive technology and natural language to answer that. Another point about this, the technology came initially from programs that was called Kalo in the United States. Kalo stood for Cognitive Assistant that Learns and Organizes. It was, it was a DARPA program. DARPA is a Defense Department uh, research arm of the United States. And that was the largest artificial intelligence program in the history of the United States. SRI led this program. Uh, it was about $150, $180 million, and we had about 23 subcontractors, including the who's who of the academic world, including Stanford and Berkeley and Carnegie Mellon and others. Okay, the next slide I'm going to reveal to you, uh, this is the first time it's been publicly revealed ever, actually is the slide that, w and I put in a little frame because I want to hang it on a wall uh, someday. When we created Siri the Venture, that was our technology plan. It wasn't quite an architecture. It doesn't show the wiring and so forth. But that was our plan. This was the plan for Siri. And um, let's see if this has a little pointer in it. I guess it doesn't. So I'll point to it. The plan was uh, have a smartphone, recognize the, the intent of a sentence. Notice that we didn't even wor worry about much about speech recognition. Speech server was down there. Recognize the intent of a sentence and um, go to a web service that's over here on the right and access the web service based on the person's request and answer it. Okay, 
So if you look at these charts, blow it up a little bit, what's in red was what actually was implemented when Siri was a company. So let me explain again. We started this company in 2008, actually January of 2008. It was bought uh, by Apple. It was, the, the product came out in February of 2010 and it was bought by Apple in April 2010. So two months after it was launched, it was bought. Not much time to do what we fully planned to do. And so this is the first time I've been able to give a talk where I want, I'm telling people, what was the plan of Siri the Venture? But I don't want you to stop there. I'm going to go through these boxes in a second, but this is, this is important for you to understand. It's really the basis of this whole talk, which is what was left to be done that we didn't do because we only had two years before Apple bought it. Now, this is not to say that Apple couldn't do wonderful things, and will. It took a great team to do it. But this is what was done. The other point about it, so I'm going to go through these boxes that aren't outlined in red as well. Not right now, but I'm going to briefly walk you through them, and then I'm going to give you example after example of what's left to be done. Okay? Another point is, that's not all. Our vision in 2008, which is when we wrote this chart, was not a complete vision. And much more has happened. Much, much more has happened. So I'll give you a vision well beyond what this chart indicates as well. OK? So that's the basis of this talk. So let me just uh, point to a few things up here. Intent recognition, remember I said, get me a hotel reservation, and buy me a ticket, those kind of things. That's what is in the upper left-hand corner. By the way, the iPhone was I, the, the I, uh, iPhone was the only smartphone that we were deploying it for initially. Um, the iPad hadn't been invented yet, obviously. And the intelligence part, Siri intelligence, was understanding and app uh, applying that intelligence of the intent to finding the web service, reasoning about it, and giving you the answer. Okay, buying you the ticket, making the reservation. Context management was only just begun. Context means if I'm sitting in San Francisco, you should, the system should know that. And if I'm asking for a nearby restaurant, if I just ask for a hotel, it should maintain the context of the previous query. And I'm going to show you how much, much more has been done in context. Dialogue. Dialogue wasn't done at all. If you have a complex query, any of you, and you want to, I'm going to give you an example, like, why did I get a fee in a bank? I'll show you that in a few minutes. If you have a complex query, do you think you can do it all in one long question? That's not human. It's not. So what this system and the future system we planned was back and forth dialogue, just like with a human. And in fact, your best mental model for a virtual personal assistant should always be the best we can do is what another human does. That's, that's going to be the, the, the basis. Learning and personalization. Isn't it some, uh, obvious that a system like this ought to know you, learn from you, not have to make the same mistakes? Siri, as, it, as we know it today, um, has frustrated many people many people around the world because, it, for example, you may speak, but it doesn't learn that, you know, you can tell it, I meant to say this, and it'll still not get that, right? So learning personalization, that was not implemented yet. Delight management, that was really a major theme that, um, that we never got a chance to do as well. And what we mean by that is, if I know everything about you and what your interests are, what your favorites are, where you are, this goes back to, I ought to be able to delight you. If your flight is late, I ought to be able to just make a recommendation to take the later flight. If, you want, if your flight is very late, I ought to suggest hotels for you, and so on. So I'm going to show you some delight management, too. Now, um, so 
I'm really interested in the audience as you speak later in the questions as well, but during if you like, about where you see series both success and failure. But the successes have been really important in the understanding of natural language and applying it to helping make, make people work. Now, one last point. I'm going to give you a little history. This is, Siri wasn't the first major um, vision of a virtual personal assistant. In 1987, uh, Scully, actually, at Apple and his team created the vision for the Knowledge Navigator. So let's take a look at that vision just for a minute. This is 1987. That's your first iPad. You have three messages. Your graduate research team in Guatemala, just checking in. Robert Jordan, a second semester junior, requesting a second extension on his term paper. And your mother reminding you about your father. Surprise birthday party next Sunday. Today you have a faculty lunch at 12 o'clock. You need to take Kathy to the airport by 2. You have a lecture at 4.15 on deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. Right. Let me see the lecture notes from last semester. No, that's not enough. I need to review more recent literature. Pull up all the new articles I haven't read yet. So again, Journal articles only? Context. Mm -hmm. Fine. Discovery. Your friend Jill Gilbert has published an article about deforestation in the Amazon and its effects on rainfall in the Sub-Sahara. Conversation. It also covers drought's effect on food production in Africa and increasing imports of food. Contact. Okay, so you see, there was a great vision there. Actually, all of these... Um, that we just saw wasn't, I cut the video off a little bit for the purposes of this presentation. All of these uh, are being implemented today. So you're going to see some startups that are implementing these ideas as we speak, in particular um, conversation, discovery, and the like. Now, another important point is anybody that gives a talk about virtual personal assistance really ought to not just talk about Siri. This world is emerging rapidly, and this conference between geeks and bosses uh, ought to at least give ideas about how this will happen and what we'll do to the enterprise. So Watson, by the way, is uh, started by IBM, and they have announced and created a virtual personal assistant too. It's actually very different from Siri, very complementary, in the sense that Watson takes your uh, query or kind of sentence, understands it, and mines vast amounts of information to find similar or patterns of information and respond back to you. Very different than Siri that is looking for a website and just looking for a few key words as to what you wanted and reasoning back. So different type of approach. Watson, uh, and just in case you uh, hadn't seen this, you know, Watson has, was competing in a game called Jeopardy in the United States. And just like uh, IBM had won Big Blue, Watson won this game called Jeopardy. Okay? And the game is give me an answer and tell me what the question is. So Watson was able to look at this. Uh, Watson's represented by that little symbol over there and beat the other two contestants in the game. Since that time, IBM has announced that Watson will become a virtual personal assistant in areas like finance and health and other areas. This is going to be a massive uh, opportunity. IBM claims it will already bring billions to IBM uh, in the near future. So the point to the bosses in the room, as well as the geeks, is that virtual personal assistants are going to be a differentiator and disruptor in every market, okay? So I'm going to give you examples of different markets, and it's going to be different virtual personal assistants as well. 
It's not going to be one virtual personal assistant, and I'll explain why. Okay, so this is a challenge. You, if you folks in the audience ought to be thinking of challenging me as to why I think that. So let me just give you a little bit of, of history. First of all, um, if you see those blue uh, circles, Apple and Google, those were the first two to really compete. Google with Google now, now Apple starting with Siri, uh, to create virtual personal assistants that cross many different market domains, many different market domains. I put others up there that I expect to come along and probably relatively soon that haven't yet come along. Facebook, LinkedIn, Amazon, Microsoft, of course they're going to start inventing these. I have no personal information, but it's got to be obvious. Then, that's you in the middle. And what's going to happen is, um, as we just said, in every market, in these little sectors, you're going to be able to access virtual personal assistants. Now, let me explain why it's going to have to be in sectors. The limitations of the technology, which is also why Siri fails sometimes in the approaches that Apple has taken, is that understanding the intent of a sentence is extremely difficult. We are not there yet in this world for computing systems to maintain sufficient context and understanding to understand the intent of every sentence. How did we solve it with Siri? We actually, as we, when we created the, the, uh, the startup, restricted it to travel and entertainment. That's why you saw those hotels and things of that nature. But if we hadn't restricted it to travel and entertainment and we said, okay, we'll do everything, finance, travel, health, and all those other areas, Siri would have failed. And the reason is, the intent is so, the number of intents that you might have that humans can hold and change context is so large that a computing system, even that tries to understand natural language with all the models, the technology behind it called statistical language models and grammar-based language models and all of that, cannot have enough data and enough algorithms that can sort out what the correct intent was meant to be. It just can't right now. Now, I believe that there's going to be a battle of the researchers who are going to claim we can extend and broaden these market sectors so that we will. But right now, if you tried to do finance and then you tried to do retail and you said, you know, how much money does it take to, to buy a, uh, a TV set, you know, and um, uh, you would have a difficult query. It's possible that you could do that. It's possible that the query could be doing that. But on many other interpretations of that might be that you're, it's really asking you, you're really asking to find out your balance of your checking account, or are you really asking to find the price of the set, or some other intent. It's just too broad right now. So the narrower you can make it, the more successful you would be with the natural language understanding to, and reasoning technology to work. So I believe that we will see different virtual personal assistants in every market sector. And, uh, and then those, those additional dots in this constellation are going to be through competition. Now, uh, Nuance and its public announcements, Nuance again, uh, is an independent company now. It's a public company. We originally spun out the original nuance out of SRI in 95, uh, 90, and then became public in 95. This is the new nuance uh, since then. That nuance has already been announced that it's working in all these different market sectors with a, with a uh, virtual personal assistant called Nina, for example. And so there are many competitors in this area. But the point I'm making about them is that they're not doing it for one virtual personal assistant for all finance. There's going to be a different one for Wells Fargo, for Citibank, for Chase. They're all going to have to have their own. So that will, that will spread tremendously fast. And you can believe this is happening now. I can't tell you what I've been, the banks I've been interacting with but you can believe that it's happening now in finance, health, and everywhere else. People are lining up 
in all the areas um, to create virtual personal assistants in this space. Okay, enough about the generalities. Let's give some examples. So, a financial virtual personal assistant. This example came from, and I'm allowed to speak because we publicly gave this information from the Spanish bank BBVA, one of the top 20 or 30 banks in the world. And BBVA and SRI helped create Lola. Okay, so um, on the left hand side, you see your account information, but imagine that what we're seeing on the right-hand side is on your mobile device, and you're asking Lola, Lola, Lola a question. What we implemented for this beyond Siri now is the first time that dialogue and conversation can be done. Because when you ask for a fee, such as the example, why did I get charged a fee, that can't all be done in one sentence. It's like when you talk to a human. Why did I get charged a fee? And so the system would say, Norman, you were charged a fee because you had an inadequate balance in your checking account. Doesn't that leave you unsatisfied right now? Okay, that's just the definition. That's like an FAQ. It's just the answer of why I got charged a fee. But suppose I then responded in conversation, no, I didn't, because I recently deposited a check. Well, this virtual personal assistant could respond again. Yes, a check was deposited, but it posted after your statement date. That's information. This system now went back into the back end of a bank, found your account information, identified a check, saw that that check was actually not deposited at the given date, and told you that. But I'm not happy about that anyhow, and I'd rather let them know I'm not by saying, okay, but I'm a good customer. Can you please forgive us? And let me check your account history. Well, was going back, checking the account history. Norman, I have checked your account and you do have a good history, so we will remove the fee. Okay, this is important. This is not just a trick. This virtual personal assistant was now not only looking into your account information, it was also applying rules of the bank. The bank probably had rules that say, if you have this kind of balance, you haven't done this before, you have been a good customer, we will give you forgiveness on the first, on the first uh, interaction. But there's more to this. What's the best time for an enterprise to reach out to a customer? It's when the customer's reached out to them and they've given them a good experience. And what do you do then? And to help maintain your good account status, would you like me to set up overdraft protection for you? Okay. The bank is now setting up more information, uh, more, another account. It's generating revenue now because it's setting up a new account that has overdraft privileges associated to it. The best time to do that. And I say, yes, let's set that up. Great, I'll set it up for you now. And that's that, okay? This kind of conversation ability now exists, um, and we are deploying our a venture uh, in this space. You have, it's now still in stealth mode, you will see uh, what these ventures are doing, but that's the beginning of conversation. It's more than conversation, though. It's surprising and delighting you that you're able to get this kind of answer. Five minutes? Um, I thought this was a 40-minute talk. Oh. Okay. Um, Five minutes till questions, or five minutes till, um, five minutes that I should finish, and then five minutes of questions. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, travel virtual personal assistant. Here's an example of a virtual personal assistant called Desti. Uh, Desti understands you and tailors it to you. Desti does, allows you to query. This is, again, a venture coming out of SRI. It allows you to query, and it sifts through thousands of places for you, just like a travel agent would. Right now, if you go to Yelp or travel, any travel uh, site, 
you have a problem of understanding ratings and all of that. This now uses that big data of the back end to do that for you. Um, and it adds context. If you add more, it'll understand more, and it'll give you what you want. So that's the travel example of Desti. There's also tools for personal productivity. Um, Tempo. This just got launched to huge acclaim in Silicon Valley. It's about your calendar. Your calendar hasn't changed for about 2,000 years or so. It used to be in stone, then it's in paper, then it's digital. But in all those cases, it didn't do anything for you. But your calendar actually keeps the tempo of your life. So it intelligently connects you to your email and your applications. It learns about what you're doing, and it connects you to your people, gives you information. This is one of those VPAs that doesn't uh, need you to request anything. It sees what you're doing and predicts answers for you. So Tempo, here's an example of reminding you of a person that you're seeing. There's a birthday. Uh, it, it can look at your emails. It can look at your LinkedIn profiles and remind you about that. It finds relevant emails. Um, it gives you the documents you want to bring to your meeting. It helps you, um, even brings up, if you're running late, it sees where you are in context, and then it says, would you like, I'm running late, because it knows that you're not there. Here's another example of a virtual personal assistant in education. Um, we're doing another startup in this space called Kawato. Kawato is a educational uh, for a coding uh, uh, company. And it decided to make coding easy by creating a deep gaming experience. But also part of that is how people learn. And people learn by virtue of being tutored. And in this, in this game, we actually have a tutor that goes along with you as another one of these robotic systems and the tutor is, um, you can ask questions of it, it'll answer, it'll be like your friend, your buddy. Okay. Search and discovery is another area, personalized search and discovery. There's a company called Trapit that we created. Trapit, um, you know how everybody knows how to do Google search, you know how to do Google news, you know how to get information. Well, this is a personal story that I'll briefly explain. The personal story is a friend of mine, this kind of trap it is very different. Uh, I'll explain how. A friend of mine had prostate cancer. Unfortunately, actually, he died recently. But since he was diagnosed and, and it was metastatic, he had, he had lived eight years, incredibly long beyond what was expected. What had happened was, and what he loved was, trap it allows you to create what's called a trap, news. And he created something called news about prostate cancer. But what's different about this is it's personalized. It watched what he read and how long he read. It watched what he deleted and it watched what he shared. And it watched all of uh, his interactions. As a result, it changed the, the material it sent to him. So eventually it was only sending him information about new clinical trials that would allow him to take more drugs that would let him live longer. And this was what was possible. Personalized information based on what this person interacted, passively watching what you were doing and providing a discovery mechanism to that individual. So that's what happened there. And to summarize, um, virtual personal assistants are going to be everywhere. You heard about the Internet of Things and uh, in David Rose's talk. But what's different about this is, first of all, sensors are going to be everywhere, They're certainly accessing data services. Your five senses are inadequate compared to what a VPA can do. It will sense data in the data universe. It will sense from pulse and heartbeat and blood pressure and all of those areas. VPAs will be everywhere. Okay. Um, Let's give some examples, though, of your daily life. And here's some VPAs everywhere. First of all, this is already examples of things that exist today, like Nest 
gives you access to your home uh, heating system. But what if you could say to your home, I'm going away, I'd like you to stop the newspapers, stop the mail, and turn the lights on and off. That's the kind of thing that's going to be happening. Or what about if you're driving a car and you're using augmented reality, another technology, that's going to allow you to... Sorry? Did you have a... Is that five minutes or...? Okay. The augmented reality that's going to allow you, if it sees that you're going to pass a car, give you information not only about passing the car, but about what's the best way to do it. Or an augmented reality uh, system that helps you see, um, go back to here, you know, if you're a mechanic, an augmented reality system that helps you see the different components in a car or an engineer. So, uh, to summarize, you are going to, and, and the complexity of all of that, you clearly are going to have all of these virtual personal assistants. Around those virtual personal assistants, there's going to be a new concept. And this is the final concept I want to bring up. The new concept is my VPA. It's not going to be enough for you to interact with all those virtual personal assistants. It's, it's draining and demanding on you for all of your life. There will, in fact, be a concept of a VPA that functions for you that talks to all the other virtual personal assistants. It learns about you, it learns about your preferences, and it maintains your privacy and security of your own life. It's going to be crucial because the battle of VPAs is going to be to try it as massively as possible access information about you without you actually wanting to provide that information always. And you're going to need my VPA to, to do that for you. So VPAs are going to discover for you. They're going to learn for you, for me. They're going to simplify for us our lives. They're going to save us time and money. And they're going to surprise and delight us. And so ultimately, the VPA will know us. So, um, merci. <laughs>